<laughs> Delegate John Hardy is our guest here on the program. John, good morning to you. Hey, good morning, gentlemen. Uh, how are you all this morning? I'm doing well. Did you watch the MASH finale, John? Maybe, maybe you were too young for it. No, I probably didn't watch it when it was... What year was that? 1983. Yeah, I'd have been 10 years old. I probably watched it. Yeah, okay. That's fair. Did, yeah. Did you yeah. see it, Maria? Uh, I do not. I mean, I think I saw it after the fact, mm-hmm. but not not, um, live that not then. I wasn't wasn't a big MASH fan. Okay. Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. Sorry I brought it up. That's okay. I'll edit this part out of the playback. <laughs> no, it's fine. Uh, it's jo- all fine. John, uh, am, are we yanking you out of a session here? Or are you guys still in yeah. caucus or what? No. No, I ran out of session real quick. I thought I was going to be late. I was trying to pick a fight on the House floor, and <laughs> and uh, uh, someone else kind of took my did, took it over for me, and uh, so I was able to punch out of there and come out here and give you guys a call. So, all right, I got to ask because this I didn't hear about this or see it until the next day. It showed up in our comment section that you went at it with somebody on the floor and then apologized the next day. Do you recall that incident? <laughs> well, that's not completely true. I went at it on the floor with someone over a very poor piece of legislation that I thought was poorly crafted. I thought that it did not meet the financial oversight that it should have had for finance, and I let my emotions get the best of me uh, in my floor fight. And so the next day, I did not apologize to the delegate, and I did not apologize about the legislation. I did apologize to the House as a whole because I did not feel like I had carried myself in the character in which I typically carry myself, and I'm a better delegate than that, so I, I, I apologize to the House and said I, I let my emotions get the best of me um, over um, a piece of legislation that I still think is a poor piece of legislation, and I think that it did not have the financial oversight that it should have had. But, uh, you know, I, I wasn't proud of my actions on the floor that day, and I, I, I really try to hide myself, hold myself to a you know high moral standard and character, and I, so I thought I... I owed the house of apology. Um, some didn't think I did, but that's the road I took. So I appreciate the clarification. Yep. J- John, we just discussed the House vote on relaxing some of the mandates for vaccination with uh, Dr. Kevin McLaughlin a moment ago. How did you vote on that House bill? Yeah, was be a no vote on any of the vaccination Can, stuff. John, you got cut uh, off think- by a bad cell. Can you repeat that again? I, I was a no vote. I'll always be a no vote on vaccination stuff. I believe vaccinations, you know, we're not talking about the vaccinations for um, uh, COVID and those type of vaccinations. We're talking about vaccinations that children need to go to school. We're talking about measles, mumps, rubella, uh, you know, th- things that are the vaccinations that we've all been vaccinated against that we ha- everyone has had for years and years and years and years. Um, you know, I've always been a proponent of vaccinations. Uh, I think that if you, you know, go to the cemeteries, you know, before World War II, when a lot of those vaccinations were being developed, you'll see a lot of graves of dead children that died from things that are very treatable. And I think that it's uh, very important for us to keep that in check. And I also believe that uh, this piece of legislation is probably just the camel's nose under the tent. I think you'll see more and more legislation every year trying to back off from those vaccination regulations for children to attend school. Um, you know, if you don't want to get your children vaccinated and you want to homeschool them, that's that's fine. Uh, those children will not be able to participate in uh, the Tim Tebow stuff, but the stuff that we've passed where homeschool children can participate in schools. But uh, I, I believe in vaccinations. I believe that they've proven to save a lot of lives. And uh, so I was a no vote. Why is this a movement in West Virginia right now? Because the legislature has turned into a bunch of social warriors. I mean, it's one of the reasons why I'm leaving the legislature. I, I came down here as a George W. Bush type Republican, as a Chamber of Commerce Republican wanting to uh, make businesses uh, as, work as easy as possible, cut taxes, control government spending, trying to be able to um, just make West Virginia a very friendly place to do business. And I think we have accomplished that, but we have this next wave of Republicans that are coming into the legislature who are social warriors and believe that they must take up every social issue that they can. And, and um, we've spent this legislature this year has been spent a lot on social issues that uh, that quite frankly i don't think that the legislature needs to be involved in so um it's quite frustrating sometimes for someone like me who's an economic development guy uh believes in you know right size government um rights you know the taxing our, our constituents as least as possible and really dealing with that side of it I, like i said i didn't come down here to be a social warrior 
Bill. Yeah, John, you've just in the last minute and a half uh, reinforced why so many of us will feel sorry you leaving the le- uh, the uh, uh, the legislators. I I think you've uh, you framed it extremely well, and I want to applaud you for your stance on both the vaccination and your view about we're shifting from a uh, uh, George W. Bush uh, Republican to cultural warriors, which I think is sad to see. Well, there's there's become this mantra of win at all costs. Salt the fields, poison the wells, you know, kill the women and children. Doesn't matter what we have to do, it's win at all costs. And, you know, to me, the the best part of, of being involved in politics is the art of compromise. I mean, it's one of the best one of the best feelings in the world is to get into a room with, you know, five people on one side and five people on the other side, and everybody just have a great debate and great discussion and come out of there with, with something that's good. And, you know, maybe maybe everybody's not happy, but, you know, the, the art of compromise uh, in the political realm uh, is is really in trouble right now. It's really a win at all cost, and and uh, and and I'm hoping that this is a uh, is a passing, um, uh, you know, this this is passing, and then we can work through this and get back to the parts of the of what the legislature should really be doing. Maria. So um, this past weekend, uh, John, a uh, gentleman by the name of Stephen Allen Adams, maybe you've run into him. He is a reporter, um, primarily Ogden newspapers, but he wrote a column, a piece about <laughs> this being just sort of a law uh, session, um, maybe just up until this point, perhaps. But um, and I know you're we wouldn't ever call you a lame duck but um you're on your way out but what's your overall perception up to this point of um of this legislative session it is the slowest blandest legislature that i've been involved in in six years um just not a lot running and 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 i'll tell you why i think there's a few reasons why that's happening okay first reason i believe is is all the elections. So you have all of your constitutional officers that are up for re-election. You have those, those guys are all moving around. You know, so those the Secretary of State, the Attorney General, the Auditor, the Treasurer, all those things are, are in play. So there's not a lot of legislation coming from them. The governor uh, believes that he is, you know, way up in his race. So the governor is, is very vanilla this year. He's not offering a lot of stuff for us to do from the governor's side. Uh, the other point I believe is, this is the first year that we have the tax cuts that are in statute. And as a finance, as a, as a uh, finance committee, we're working about four months behind the curve because we don't really know where we're going to end up at, where the triggers are going to be, because we don't know where the year's going to end and we don't know how much money we have. So I think this being the first year of that being in place, uh, we're playing it very cautious with spending. I think you're not going to see a lot of new spending. I think you're going to see probably not a lot of spending in the back of the budget. I think the back of the budget's going to be controlled this year. But I think what you will see is you will see us come back down here in August in a special session to probably make appropriations that we did not make in this legislature because we will know more. And I think as we get out further year after year on these tax cuts and kind of anticipate how this is going to work, that you'll probably see that go away. But I think with this being the first year of these tax cuts being in statute, not really knowing where we're going to end up at, where the triggers are going to be, and where we're going to be financially. I mean, you know, we we have the projections, but I think that's why everyone's probably being very, very cautious this year. Uh, John, last Friday we raised the issue, should we uh, restructure our sessions and have every other year uh, just be restricted to budget items and then the odd year, the off-election year, that we look at uh, other issues? Uh, Would you be an advocate of that, or do you think that the structure we have today is probably the most appropriate? No, I I would not be an advocate of that. I think the the structure that we have now is is a is a good structure. I think what I would do is maybe would I would like to put a maybe a small break in there. So maybe still keep a sixty day legislative session, but maybe put a twenty day break in between the middle of that, so we are not so rushed. Um, sometimes trying to get all of our stuff done. So maybe we could meet for thirty days, have a twenty day hiatus, let staff catch up, uh, let let some of the policies. 
uh, be worked through, um, you know, and then come back for another 30 days to, to try to get it all figured out. So I think if we kind of had a broken session like that, it may th- make things work a little better. Uh, but, you know, this 60-day this session, is uh, it's very fast-paced. The learning curve is sharp and quick. Um, and, you know, it's hard to get legislation passed. And, and it's designed to be that way. I mean, it's designed, you know, to make legislation and, and to make law is designed to be a tough process. I mean, you know, in the House, you need 51 votes. You need the votes in the Senate. And then, oh, by the way, you got to make sure that the governor is not going to veto it. So it's it's made to be a daunting process. And, and you know, sometimes people don't like to hear, but maybe the hands of government should move slowly because the hands of government are so powerful. John, can you talk to me about the left lane bill? That was recently uh, passed, 68 to 31, HB 5237. What a piece of garbage. I'm telling you, we, <laughs> there was a Senate bill that came over, and we killed it on the House floor. And then there was a House bill that came up that was able to pass uh, by a narrow margin. But, I mean, it's just a, just another one of those bills. I mean, how the, how are you going to enforce that? I mean, that's just another government overreach of, you know. I mean, listen, it's already illegal to drive in the left lane if you're not passing or if you're not at a greater speed than the people in the right lane. We're going to pass a special piece of legislation that now puts more directives on it. It's the people that, that live over by the Ohio border and who say the people in Ohio just like to put around in the left lane. But, yeah, I, I, I wasn't a big proponent of it. So I thought it was – I voted against it on both bills. I saw the delegate Kump did, too. He's quoted in the article on Metro News. Uh, also, the uh, the Senate passed a bill yesterday that's going to allow high school students to play club sports as well during their sports season so they could play with, for two teams in the same sports season. If that makes its way to the House, John, you have any thoughts on how you might treat that? Yeah, let them play. I mean, if they want to play, let them play. I've, I've always voted for all those bills that the homeschool kids wanted to play on the – the high school teams, let them play. If the kids wanted to move schools and play at another school, let them play. I, I, I don't think I'm down here to legislate high school sports. I mean, if that's uh, that's something else the legislature's gotten involved in, you know, how what kids can go to what school and what sports they can play and when they can play them. And so, I, you know, I've, I've always said if they want to play, let them play. If they want to play six sports, let them. That's the that's the parental. That's the parents. That's the you know. Let's. Let's let the parents make those decisions. I don't think the legislature needs to be making those decisions. And I think I think that's the the piece. Um, it used to be the West Virginia Secondary Schools Athletic Commission that, you know, was sort of the be all end all of of the parameters of how you do those kinds of things. And then all of a sudden, you know, we're we're worried about the transfer rule, and we're worried about. You know, yeah, this, playing... this overrides the SSAC. Basically. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And yeah. if we're talking about overreach and we don't want government overreach, then some of these issues seem, um, I don't know, just sort of counterintuitive to what um, what what folks say individually versus what yeah. happens as a um, as an entity. Hey, listen, I'm here to work on real-world issues. I'm here to work on infrastructure for the Eastern Panhandle. I'm here to work on cutting taxes. I'm here to work on streamlining government, right-sized government, controlling spending, um, trying to work a flat budget. Those are the things that I'm interested in. Like I said, there's a lot of issues down here that I get drawn into because I have to be drawn into them, and it's part of the job, and I certainly understand that. But it's not one of John Hardy's priorities. John Hardy's priorities are trying to make the lives of the people in the eastern panhandle as good as they can be in the state of West Virginia. So, uh, John, the Im- impression that we have is that the real, uh, real world issues have been solved, and they're going to uh, to look at more of the cultural issues, Big Brother watching, bigger government, and the like. I don't think that's true. Uh, have all the real world issues been solved? And if they have not, why uh, why aren't the legislators addressing them? Well, I'll tell you, Bill, I think all the low-hanging fruit is gone. I think that the legislature has been under Republican control for now for about 10 years and maybe 12 years, and I do believe that all the low-hanging fruit is gone, and we have implemented a lot of things that the Republican Party wanted to implement. I think now is we're trying to hold the line um, you know, on some of the uh, uh, legislation that we've passed and trying to make sure that that legislation gets implemented by some of our Uh, state agencies you know sometimes there's a lot of pushback from agencies to actually implement the legislation that we pass 
Um, so, you know, we're constantly working on that with our rules reviews and, and those type of things. But I do believe that there's still work to be done. But a lot of the big things have been done. You know, a lot of the, of the restructuring of our courts and restructuring of a tort reform and also our, you know, uh, our, our, how our agencies work and the taxes and how we collect and flatline budgets and a lot of things that we've worked on. A lot of those things are done and we're, I would say that the legislature is in a posture where they're trying to just maintain what they have accomplished and also giving those accomplishments time to play out. So that may be why you're seeing some, you know, some of the, the more socially charged pieces of legislation come into fruition. But I would argue, John, that still a lot of issues that should be addressed have not been addressed. One is the hardening of the schools. The second one is protecting our children. Uh, the SROs had, was proposed and it was shot down because of the uh, uh, the uh, the physical note attached to it. Uh, we have not heard very much about child protective service. Uh, that problem has not gone away. Uh, these are issues that should be looked at, but if they have been looked at this this session, it is not particularly obvious. Well, Bill, I will tell you that I have worked that SRO bill upside down, backwards and forwards, and that has been some 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 very frustrating days and frustrating nights. I have worked that legislation as hard as I've ever worked any piece of legislation since I've been here, and and I can't, I just I can't get any movement on it. You know, the twenty eight million dollars per year. You know, it works out to being $114.24 per student in the state of West Virginia to make your student a hell of a lot safer than they are right now. I can't guarantee you that they're 100% safe, but for $114.24 per student across the state, we can put an SRO, not in every school, but we can, we can get a lot more of them, and we can put them in a lot more schools, and we can make a lot more children safer. And I'm, I'm quite frustrated I've not been able to get movement on that piece of legislation um, but you know, um, you can. I'm sure you can hear the frustration in my voice. But it's it's something that I feel that we need to be very proactive about. I certainly don't want to be reactive. Um, like I said before, there's not a lot of things that keep me up at night. But that's one thing that I'm very concerned about. And and I hope this legislature, in some point in time, will realize that uh, you know, $114.24 per child is not a lot of money to spend to keep them a lot safer than they are today. Was the uh, having the uh, uh, the the teachers concealed carry was that a smoke screen to avoid putting SRO bill uh, uh, passing? I, I can't really speak to that bill. I don't know. I, I, I don't know if I mean that bill was going to run, and, and it was not a bill that I was crazy about, but. It was something that I supported because I thought anything we can do to make children safer, as I've said on this show many times before, school teachers are school teachers and law enforcement officers are law enforcement officers, and it's kind of hard to mix the two. I did support the legislation. I don't think it was a smoke screen. I think that Delegate Doug Smith was, you know, all in on that piece of legislation. And But, uh, it, you know, it didn't have a, a cost, but, you know, the cost was didn't cost the, tax, the, the legislature money, so... And my bill did. My bill cost $28 million a year base building and probably was going to grow and understand, you know, being fiscally responsible is, is, is important, but also is having the ability to protect our children in the schools also. So there is a request for $178 million from the school building authority for the hardening of the schools and everything that they need. Uh, I don't know what their allocation is going to be. I think it's probably going to be somewhere maybe around $50 million. Um, and I'm not exactly sure how they're going to spend that money, and they haven't come up with all those plans yet. John, on that note, we are out of time. I thank you very much for ducking out to make a call in to us this morning. Hey, thanks, guys. I appreciate it, and uh, be home in about, what, 11, 12 days, something like that? Not far. There you go. Yeah. Thanks, John. All right. Thank you. Mm, thank you. Mm, bye-bye. Delegate John Hardy, as he mentioned, he's leaving the legislature after this uh, term to run for a seat on the Berkeley County Commission. A lot less driving uh, that way.